Good afternoon, everyone. So hopefully we didn't eat too much for lunch and everybody would be snoozing on me, but if not, I can throw some, some bottles of water at you to keep you awake if we need that. So I was actually, I was in Texas uh, until last night, and, uh, and here I am in, in Florida, and my wife asked me, she said, why are you following the hurricanes? You know? And I said, don't worry, honey, I'm not going to Puerto Rico tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going the other direction. <laughs> but, you know, I, I actually had a nice little Texas joke, that, but I won't, I won't share that with you guys because you don't want to care about what the Texans think. Anyway. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll advance it myself. Not a problem. So this isn't going to be extremely technical, but it's something that I've come to realize as we all, with what's going on with the IoT, that blockchain is, is going to become an important facet to it. So I'm going to try and take you through that. I have a bunch of statistics that I like to, to talk about. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm not going to talk too much about me, but I was trained as a, as a chemist. I was a, have a master's degree in organic chemistry and started out in research and found out I didn't like to do that. And so I moved into business, moved into uh, plastics, electronics, and semiconductors and security for some odd reason. And I've been doing, so I did smart cards. The chip that we all have in our card, that was my product 20 years ago when nobody knew what that was. The RFID tags we have in our cars, that was also my product 20 years ago when nobody knew what that was, except for the cows, because the cows all have it. <coughs> and so I've been doing authentication. I'm working now as a, as a consultant for Vasco Data Security, and they do user authentication, biometric uh, types of authentication for mobile payment, for banking apps, and things like that. And I'm also the uh, chairman of Oath, which is the organization of, uh, it's called the Initiative for Open Authentication. Ten years ago, a bunch of companies got together, Symantec, IBM, Active Identity, and a few others, and, and decided to write algorithms to try and standardize multi-factor authentication. And today, unbeknownst to you, but everybody uses Oath. Because if you have Google Authenticator on your phone, Microsoft, Computer Associates, whatever you're using, if it's an MFA, whether it's a, an SMS token or something, an app on your phone, it uses the Oath algorithms. Because there's Oath and then there's RSA. RSA has decided to stay proprietary. Oath is open source. You can download it and, and do it yourself if you want. So with that said, let's move on a little bit about what we're talking about, what's going on with blockchain. First off, we all know the IoT is, is, is growing. I'm going to show you some numbers, how it's growing. Everybody argues about how much it's growing and where it's going. But it is causing some, some angst among a lot of companies, right, with the challenges that it faces. So we need to secure the IoT. And people realize that now. They did not a couple years ago when everybody started connecting everything together. So, we need to be able to do that so we can sense what's going on, because there have been sensors, and there are sensors everywhere, right? It used to be in a car. A couple of years ago, a car would have four or five sensors on them. Now they have dozens of sensors. And you have all these inputs, and we need to control those inputs and secure them. We need to process it, store it, and communicate. So some of the trends that's going on, we're, we're increasing the applications you know, dramatically. Uh, all the devices are going to be connected like dots if they're not already. The gateways, this is really what's starting to happen with the IoT marketplace. There will be gateways so that you can go from system to system, platform to platform, so, without, so it's seamless. That's the key. We want seamless connectivity. Uh, big data is the key to it, right? The analytics, companies want that information. They want to be able to use that information to market to us. Uh, the machine learning is, is being integrated with it and there's a big focus today on IoT security because we saw what happened, right? Just looking at the numbers, the network security aspect to it is going to be the largest size for IoT. The protocols such as LPWAN, ZigBee, Glowpan, Bluetooth, Z-Wave, NFC, there's a plethora of different types of protocols that are being used. And do you know what happens? These things don't talk to one another, not easily. And this is the problem. When you try and transition from platform to platform, you're getting into areas where there's a lot of uh, 
clear text and openness that's not secure, it may not be encrypted, and it's ripe to being stolen and, and hacked. So many of these things aren't going to be sophisticated. You know, we, we, we talked about the light bulbs, and they say, well, you know, a light bulbs, we can't put secure devices on the light bulbs because they're too cheap. But yet those light bulbs can be used against us, as we've seen, right? They can become the bots. So as we have more and more devices in our homes, I mean, today we, we have anywhere from six to 10 devices, right, in our homes that are, that are IoT enabled. Tomorrow, a couple years from now, those are gonna be 20, 50. We'll have 100. Every one of our devices that has electronics in it will be connected to the IoT. Whether it's 20 billion or 50 billion, it almost doesn't matter. It's a whole heck of a lot of stuff getting connected. So looking at some of the market size projections, you know, I know most of you guys are into developing stuff, right? If you're not into developing things into the IoT security marketplace and you want a job, you're guaranteed to have one here for a long time because it's growing at 35, almost 35%. Uh, the projections are it's, it's not gonna go away. As other IT uh, departments are shrinking or, or stable, this is where all the money is going because it's crucial, right? When we start talking about infrastructure, the plumbing that goes on into the cities and into uh, the buildings, this is very important to our, our lives. You know, if it gets hacked, our lives are going to be changed dramatically. So 34% of companies were breached in the last 12 months. And 70, almost 75% of them, they don't know how. And this, this is a problem, right? <laughs> this is a problem. And the companies will pay money, right, as we've seen with it, ransomware. People will pay just so they don't hear about it. You know, not very many people know who Edward Snowden worked for. Anybody know who he worked for? They, all they say was government contractor. Yeah, exactly. But you don't see that very much in the news. It's very hard to find that information because Booz Allen paid a lot of money for negative, for minus PR. You know, a lot of companies want PR. They want their name out there. They paid a lot of money so their name did not get out there. But looking where the spending's going by the year 2020, at least 25% of the attacks are going to be on IoT. And 50% of them are going to be using cloud security. It's a little hard to see this graph, but the, uh, the blue line is the, the the, do, uh, the, the green is the, the spending dollars and, and the blue is the number of devices. And it's growing pretty exponentially. So we all understand that there is that need for the security. We saw what happened last year with the DDoS attack. This is just the beginning. There is more to come. Guaranteed we're going to be seeing this happening because it is too easy and we're not secure. So the fears, you know, is that People are realizing now that they're not secure and they don't know what they're going to do about it. So companies are starting to develop systems that have done it always the same way. And you can't do it the same way because it's not going to be secure. We need to do things differently if we want to be protected. So I'm going to show you this what do these companies have in common? And, and I, I showed this, this chart a number of years ago, and I put four companies on it, and they're going to come up. Sony, Google, Apple, and EMC. And to say, what do these four companies have in common? The largest company in America, in the world, the largest internet company, the largest security company, the largest entertainment company, and of course, they were all hacked. We all know that, right? And you could, I started filling this page, and you can just keep filling this page with, with massive companies that are hacked, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty scary, but, you know, as we saw what happened a couple weeks ago. So different views. We have the system view and the business view. When you're looking at it from a system, you have the things, the gateways, the services. And on the business side, we get the connectivity of the platform, the business model, and the apps. So why do we need strong authentication? Because, as I said, 16 million Americans were victims last year. 41 million Americans had their identity stolen. It's over $4 billion of online fraud. This is a major, it's a major problem for us, right? Main source for all the fraudsters. So as we're adding more and more devices, 
more and more connectivity. We need to have more and more security. And like I said, the old way doesn't work anymore. And I just show this is kind of cute. I just I happen to like Dilbert, you know. And so there's there's a lot of problems that people are are being faced with internally in corporate world, and some of them are, are being dealt with, and not you know all of them are. So where are we growing? So if you're looking at the things that are growing, there's going to be four billion people connected, four trillion dollars of money being spent on that, 25 million plus apps. And plus 20, 25 million plus embedded systems, over 50 trillion gigabytes of data. Where are the people getting hacked? So this, this graph comes from the uh, uh, Internet Cyber Crime Complaint Center. And it goes across all demographics. But as you can see across the bottom, the green bar, it's more expensive when people have more money, of course. As younger people have less money. But Everybody's getting hacked, right? And so, you know, why are we suspected to it? I mean, those companies that were hacked on a couple slides back, it was all preventable. This stuff is not, as you know, it's not rocket science. People are responding to phishing sites. I don't have it in this presentation, but another presentation I showed, over almost 60% of all the hacks, or I think it's 74%, is because of user credentials being stolen. And 60% of that are insiders. Out of that 60% of insiders, 45% of them are bad people, people that are disgruntled employees or, or whatnot. And then 15% of that are people that are just inadvertently clicking on something. You know, why someone like RSA the largest security company in the world at the time, I don't know if they still are, but why they would keep their seed files for their 250 million tokens on the same bloody server that they keep the email on. Why would they do that? This is a security company. I mean, this, this is not rocket science. I mean, this is basic security 101. I mean, I can understand Sony doing something stupid like that because they're an entertainment company. They're not a security company. But why would you keep it on the same server? Keep them, you know, cut the cord. Don't have them even connected. But some people don't do it. So just a couple years ago, these breaches seemed, they, they seemed large, right? Yeah, these are, these are nothing now, right? 21 million OPM. But the concern, you know, about the, the fingerprints, one of the things that Europe is very strong on and the United States is starting to, is we have laws, or they have laws against the PII, the personally identifiable information. I only have 10 fingers. And I know most everybody in this room, your fingers are in the APHIS database. When that APHIS database gets hacked, somebody's gonna have access to your fingerprints. So if that's your user authentication, and that's your only means of user authentication, and it gets taken, what are you going to do then? We need something else. That's why we're talking about a lot of different types of biometrics, why we're talking about uh, user behavioral auth authentication. You know, how you swipe, how you type, how you move, or how you hold your phone, you know, what angles do you do it at? I'm left-handed. I'll do things very differently than most people in this room. Those are the types of devices and ways that we're going to be needing to authenticate us. So now, where'd, where'd we come from? I, was, I should have asked the question if anybody knew when the first non-computer internet device was. It was 1990, which wasn't that very long ago. John Romke and Simon Hackett. But does anybody have a, a, an IT-connected hoster, a toaster now? It was kind of funny that they used the toaster. I don't know why they did that. But when you think about that, we, here we are. And just the part of one generation, we now have somewhere about 20 billion devices connected. Short period of time. So let's talk a little bit. What is blockchain, right? Why is that important? Is anybody here really deep into blockchain? And anybody using Bitcoin? Then you're using blockchain, right? Because that's, that's the foundation of it, right? So another, another Dilbertism. You know? <laughs> Mauve is a good color for blockchain, I think. So basically, it's a decentralized database, right? 
distributed ledger system. We all know accounting, accountants don't lie, right? So the numbers, the numbers are what the numbers are. That's the nice thing about blockchain, is it's a ledger system that follows all along, okay? It makes for trusted transactions, as we're going to see. Because it's distributed, you can share the record keeping because other people can see the information, but they cannot change it. So it's immutable, okay? And you can trace it all the way back to the source. Now we're gonna see some numbers. You say, that's gonna take up a lot of memory, a lot of storage. It really doesn't, actually. And it is permission-based, so that's the key, right? No one person has sole ownership of that block. And it's secure. This is why we start having all these mining companies now. There's probably, I'll show you a graph, I think, with some of them. There's probably 20 different mining companies. The key to mining is cheap electricity because you're using electricity. You need a lot of electricity. So where's the future? This guy, Clive Longbottom, said basically, he thinks, you know, it prevents the man in the middle. But I like what he said here at the bottom is, it's going to be like TCP IP and PKI is going to become a technology that's used throughout it. And blockchain is just beginning. There's, there's a couple of stages of it. It's not, it's not where it's going yet. So this is a little hard to see, but you can look at some of the companies that are involved. We have identity contact management. We have, so they only list a couple of crypto uh, mining companies. But we get browsers, we get exchanges, and all these trading companies, get money services and lending. And the blockchain is a lot more than just money. Today, it's money. Tomorrow, it's going to be smart contracts. It's going to be all sorts of things. So as we talked about this, the, the, the big attack last year before the big attack two weeks ago. <laughs> so the hope is that blockchain being decentralized will be more efficient to handling these massive amounts of data and the flowing through these devices. Because these devices today, I've been to CES the last few years and I talked to all these little companies that are making all these devices. And I said, well, what do you put on it for security? Oh, it's a password. I said, oh, that's nice. And what do you have beyond? Well, it's, the device doesn't have a microphone. It, it, it can't talk to you. It can't. I said, it doesn't matter. You're connecting it to the internet with just the password. He says, yeah, but that's, that's good, isn't it? This is what the thought process of many people that are developing these products that they're selling to, to stores and they're putting on the market and we're buying them for our kids, like these internet connected dolls that, that they can hack into, right? It's, it's really interesting. It's scary, but it it's, presents opportunities, right? So blockchain is not a cryptography framework and it's not the savior for all security issues, right? Because like I said, you can't get rid of the stupid people, right? There are still going to be people doing stupid things. It was, like, was that famous line, stupid is as stupid does, right? something like that. So basically the difference between a centralized and decentralized database with the networks, the distributed ledgers can be public or they can be private. So you can have private blockchains as well as public block blockchains. The users can be anonymous or they can be not anonymous. Okay. So how it works in a simple fashion, you have the digital signatures and it does a series of hashing and it proves the work so you can see that, that it's out there. And then you have the mining operations that, that process this. There's a great little video, if you can see it's on the bottom of the slide at anders.com blockchain. He just shows this in a nice, it's a nice little slick video. So how it compares to, this is it's kind of a faded out picture, but the control of data, and this is by power versus rules. So if you look at it from, from a traditional model, the data evolves when the, when the controlling authority changes it, right? And they take the instruction from the subordinates and they have authority over that data. But in the distributed model, the data evolves subject to predetermined rules. So that's the way it works in smart contracts. When all the rules are met, the contract is then initiated. So you don't have to sign it or wait for it, it's, it's already done. So where we are today with blockchain, it's doing currency, right? But where we're going, it's going to be contracts. We're going to be doing economic modeling, financial applications that are going to be much more extensive than just cash. It's going to be stocks, futures, loans, mortgages, 
Uh, and then blockchain 3.0 is going to be applications way beyond that. We're going to be getting into areas of government, health, and science. So this culture and art, this is probably one of the most revolutionary things to happen to the internet in the last 10 plus years, or maybe longer. So again, we all know what security is. Basically, it's a condition being protected from unintended consequences. We need confidentiality of that property, of the information. We need the integrity and the availability. You need to have all those things if you want to have a secure mode, a secure, a secure transaction, secure property. These are critical. Without that, you really don't have security. So when you look at the IoT server, you know, you have the, 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 the user interface coming in and the, the secure access manager configuration unit and going up into the gateways, the access points, and then you have all the different protocols that are running around on the top. That's where we have the problems because they're not always that secure. So the basic concepts in, in Bitcoin, there's no central authority. It's a distributed ledger, so it's shared. Trust is created through the immutable time-stamped records. Creates a record of all the transactions, so it prevents altering. And the blocks of data are chained together cryptographically. So the miners secure these transactions by performing difficult, uh, difficult computations. So real, another way how it works, if you take you know, a... Um, requesting a, a transaction, and then it goes into and it's broadcast into the network, and then it gets validated through this network of nodes, and then the verified transaction can use cryptocurrency if that's you know, usually what's happening. And then once it's verified, it gets combined and it gets built onto the existing blockchain. And the blockchain just keeps growing in that transaction, and then the transaction is complete. So a little bit about the cryptocurrencies, it's just a medium, right? It's not cash. It it's, doesn't have any intrinsic value, right? It has no physical form. So if anybody's not heard about a Merkle tree, but you can, you can see it here and you can, you can read all about it, but basically it only keeps the root hash, deletes the interior hashes to save disk space, right? And the block header only contains the root hash. And here's the numbers. It's only 80 bytes. And that's every six minutes. I mean, every 10 minutes or six per hour. It's only four megabytes per year. So it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of room. That's the key. This is why it's going to be so successful. And here's a simple Bitcoin transaction. Anyone can verify the transaction by asking the node. You get the longest proof of work on the chain, and then you query that block that it's been verified. You only need two hashes, hash one and hash two, to verify. You don't need the whole transaction chain. And that's the key. When you're doing hash functions, you only need a couple hashes. Now, some people are going to say, OK, but the hashes are not secure. I was in San Antonio uh, just yesterday listening to a, a man talk about as a company where they take five different hashes. SHA-1, SHA-256, MD5, and, and, and CRC, and one more. And they put that together. So they take all those pieces together. So if somebody is able to, because you can crack a SHA-1. I mean, you can get a hash cracker, and, right? I, anybody crack it? OK. <laughs> you don't want to raise your hand too high. OK. But you're not going to be able to crack all five, and especially if you only get pieces of it on each one. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. My wife loves doing jigsaw puzzles. I hate doing, doing jigsaw puzzles. But can you imagine doing a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and missing five pieces? You're never going to be able to put it together. And that's the way this is. That's one of the things that makes it secure. Not only are you encrypting it five different ways, five different pieces, and you put them in five different places. And that's true layered security. You don't often hear it that way, but that's really what we're talking about. So here are a couple companies. I'm not advertising any companies, but I've known one of these companies for a few years, and I didn't even know they were doing this until I was researching this and I found out about them. But 
the Puff technology, the physically unclonable device, really works into this mode. And I didn't really think about this a couple of years ago. But it really will provide the security and will, really will help out with the security in a Bitcoin and a blockchain technology. And this is what's interesting. You know, the Puff technology can authenticate and register the device to the ledger. So every piece is cryptographically proven and linked back to the authenticated uh, device with a chain of custody. I saw an interesting thing. I looked this up. The Accenture developed this smart plug. Basically, it's, it's in Britain. And it's, and it's being used by users because they can choose who they buy the electricity from. And when they're paying cash, you know, by looking at their, 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 their records, they can negotiate deals on behalf of the customers and save them money on electricity. Because you know, if we think we pay a lot of money for electricity, Europe pays a whole lot more. That's why they're, they're struggling in a lot of ways and why they've moved into so many other technologies because their electricity costs are so high because they don't have the natural resources that we have. So that smart, smart plug is a very interesting example. So if you look at some of the potential applications here, we, we look at the beginning, you have digital rights, you have digital currency, you have record keeping, and you have securities. These are all some real fundamental things that are going to change the way we do business because of blockchain. Smart contracts, as, as I talked to you about a little bit before, that they will execute themselves autonomously when the conditions are met. So there's even something here where you can automatically send people out information, cards, or, or process information on a, on a regular basis whenever these conditions are all met. So these are key for, for these sequen uh, sequential actions. And then there's a little bit about Hyperledger. Hyperledger is an open source effort, right, to advance the blockchain. It's, of course, it's a part of Linux, been hosted by Linux. And it has important features for the cross-industry collaborative. So you can look, at, you can look up hyperledger.org, and you can, you'll see a couple more things here. There's a couple of other slides. But Hyperledger is going to become a very important part of blockchain. So there are a few projects that are being done. Borrow, Fabric, Iroha, and Sawtooth. And so they're doing you know, smart, uh, permissible smart contract machines with a modular blockchain for you know, an uh, Ethereum virtual machine. There's uh, plug and play solutions with modular architecture, which is the fabric. And you have simple and easy blockchain framework uh, into infrastructure requiring this distributed ledger. This is, is going to be into the, uh, the smart cities, and this is what they're starting to use now. And the same thing with uh, Sawtooth. There must be, I think, a last talk over 20 to 30 cities in the country right now that are involved very heavily at becoming smart cities. So the Ethereum Alliance is decentralized platform that's running on smart, that runs the smart contracts. And the applications are programmed without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, or interference. So it was started by uh, Ether Presale in 2014 by the Ethereum Foundation, which is a Swiss nonprofit. And some of, some of the offerings that they have is the Ethereum wallet, which is a gateway to these applications on the Ethereum blockchain. And it allows you to hold your own cryptocurrency as a token. So a little bit about Ether. It's the crypto fuel for the Ethereum network. It's a necessary element for this distributed platform. It's a form of payment that's being used to the client, to the, for the platform to the machines. The total supply is going to be, came up from this, this pre-sale that was in 2014. And the developers are building this will use the Ethereum block Ether. So there's a bunch of industries, right? When you, when you start looking at this, where, where it's, it's being done is in the consumer world, the manufacturing, the you know, high-tech manufacturing, and the media companies, telecom, healthcare, life sciences, the, you can just keep going from industry to industry that's all starting to, to move forward with this. You know, most, most people, senior executives and companies don't even know much about it, but they realize that it's going to become uh, 
a very big disruptive technology in the future. So just an example in the financial services, uh, Michael Smith noted, and he has this book called Creating Assurance in Blockchain, as the main value drivers, right? The finance world is driven by technology. So we have to track risk and moderate the compliance with the laws and regulations with this increasingly complex security environment. So the financial industry saw major opportunities in the blockchain and they've been investing heavily in its usage. In the areas of IT management, so if you look at this chart here, we have attributes, identifiers, and uh, consist of identities, which consist of, correspond to uh, the I, I, yeah, identities and then to the entities. So without this secure transaction, identification is not really going to be there. And this is another reason why blockchain is really important, because it will secure identity. Because if you're trying to authenticate someone, you need to identify them first. Like if you have friends in this room, you can identify them when they're 100 yards away, because you can see the way they walk, you know exactly what they are. But if you don't know them, and you don't know me, and I say my name is, is, is John Schwartz, you don't have any reason to believe I'm not, right? So this is identity management is, is going to be really key, protecting access to this data. So your data cannot be stolen. People cannot become who they say they're, they're not. So we're gonna use those private keys to secure those transactions. So you create an identity on the blockchain gives us greater control over who has our personal information and how they can access it. Today, we don't have that control. The areas that we're going to see this are on passports, you know, residency, birth certificates, wedding certificates, all these things. Today, it's a piece of paper. I buy a work of art, they give me a piece of paper, a certificate of authenticity. Big deal. It's a piece of paper. It's not really secure. So digital IDs, we're going to provide these digital watermarks. These are things that are, that are shaping and going to be changing our lives. So protecting these keys, we need to have these keys secured, right? Because having them in, in a digital trust can lead to the security. So safekeeping these keys are very, is very important for us, for, for traders, for crypto traders. It's a lot better than having you know, a lock in a box, right? So digital ID solutions, we saw this company, uh, Netkey, is a California blockchain startup. There's a, a digital ID uh, smartphone app using Hyperledger. These are all starting to be, you know, with the anti-money laundering laws and rules that are out there. I have to take anti-money laundering courses every year. Uh, the KYC, you know, knowledge that's, that's there that companies have to follow in order to do things. Of course, there are going to be challenges, right? Because the technology is still in its infancy. It's still growing. There aren't that many regulations yet, but there will be, because the government's going to get involved. It uses a lot of energy. There is still some control aspects to it, right? It has some integration concerns. It's a cultural adoption issue. There's cost and there's challenges associated with the, the auditing of it and the taxes and the compliance. So on the energy consumption side, you know, the miners, attempting to do 450,000 trillion solutions per second in efforts to validate these transactions. Uses a lot of computing power. That's why we don't see them in, in high cost centers where, where there's a lot of expensive electricity. They're going to be in very, very low cost areas where you're paying you know, a few cents per kilowatt. So the impact on the audit is still, it's going to be interesting because there's going to be lots of opportunities. The identity management area is changing dramatically and there's going to be a, a, an evolution with the IT audit as more and more of these cases unfold. 
The compliance will get eased up as the technology is adopted, but there are going to be regulatory updates more and more. You know, for those of us that, you know, realize the big five, you know, the companies, you know, in, in, in basically in California, you know, you have, you know, Apple and, of course, Amazon, uh, Facebook and Google and uh, Microsoft. They're all going to come underneath federal and state control pretty soon. There are going to be regulations controlling these companies because the apps and the things that they're doing are changing our lives dramatically and governments get really concerned when that happens. Uh, so we're going to see, I mean, already EU has been coming down hard, you know, on, on Google, and we're going to see the U.S. government start to do that, too. Uh, it's, it's sad, but if you go back to the 1920s, we had one oil company that controlled all our oil supply in the United States, and they were broken up in 1934. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to these companies, but they are going to become regulated because the businesses that they're doing are getting in our daily lives and we cannot live without them. So they're going to become very, very important for the government to get involved. An example, just, just on an aside, the average number of apps that we have on our phones, if you were to read the terms and conditions on each one of those apps, it would take you an average of about seven months and eight hours a day to read all those terms and conditions that we sign. We sign away significant rights rights to our photos, rights to our words. We, everything, that, those terms and conditions, they have the rights to everything that we're using on those apps and the phones, unfortunately. They have lawyers. We don't. <laughs> so. Pardon? Absolutely. I have them all, and it's not what we're going to do. So here's some, some resources that you can look up, the Ethereum, the Hyperledger, the Open Connectivity Alliance, and uh, some uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, exchanges. And with that, oops, I think I'm done.